as the OG, I'm typically the one that has to bite the bullet on this stuff. Jump out there first, see if it's viable, see if it makes sense, and then show other people, hey, this is cool. Come on, you guys. It's safe to go this way. That's really all I'm trying to do now, you know, not necessarily for a lot of young people because they get it. Younger people are more tech savvy than, say, my generation is, right? But I want to let them know that this is a safe space that they can operate in. But it, it's it's um, it's encouraging. I will say that it is encouraging um, as an artist. You know, what new ways can I find to make this experience with the people that are appreciating my art and my music deeper? You know, how can it go further? How can it last longer? That's that's a beautiful thing. All right, we got the Trill OG with us himself, Bun B. Welcome, man. It's great to have you on the pod. Likewise, man. Thanks for having me. I'm I'm excited to have this conversation today. Yeah, man. This is this is dope because I feel like there has been so much movement lately going on with NFTs and how artists are making moves. And you've been making a bunch of moves in this space. You recently teamed up with another artist, Spotty Wi-Fi, and it's been dope just to see how you all have thoughtfully planned out what you're doing and all of the steps the past year where I feel like most people are just trying to wrap their heads around what an NFT actually is and how to do it. So yeah. it would be good to hear what was your entry point to this? Like when were you first hearing about this stuff and then something clicked when you're like, okay, I'm going to make a move in this space. So I got approached um last summer a good friend of mine used to be my video producer um advice many years ago um he reached out to me and he said bun i know you're a forward thinker i know you're you know a relatively open-minded guy have you heard of nfts and i was like vaguely but because of the fact that i was i was a little late to crypto so i wasn't you know big in discords and all of that kind of a thing so i was you know very you know, unfamiliar to be honest. He was like, well, I have a guy, he's, he's, you know, very fluent in it. And, uh, you know, he's doing these different kind of things called, um, Euler beats. And I was like, well, what is a Euler beat? And the way it was explained to me, and I'm, I'm definitely paraphrasing here. It's like a computer algorithm is put in and it kicked out beats or whatever. So basically these were beats that were kicked out by some kind of computer program or algorithm by some scientist named Euler. And so different people were, were buying these Euler beats, uh, doing remixes to them and so forth. And so one of the guys um, that owned one reached out to my friend and was like, um, you know, if, if you'd like to collaborate, I'd love to see if you would want to rap over one of these beats, you know? Um, so I did something, it was very minimal. It was really only like a hook and a verse and it was called going crazy over crypto. Um, and I just use a lot of different terminology from this, as I did my research, talking about foundation and uh, open C and stuff like that, you know, very, very surface level terminology. And um, it did fairly well because the guy that I partnered with was already well known in the space. Um, and so that went well. And I guess the word kind of got out. So then I had another friend reach out to me and he was like, hey, um, I have a good friend. He he's a crypto punk owner, and he's actually like the first crypto punk rapper. I'm like, well, I don't even know what that means, but you know, let's let's get us all on a call. And that's when I was introduced to Spotty, and Spotty explained to me the idea of the crypto punk NFT and him putting like an identity to his and turning it into like this character, and which I thought was like really cool, real cutting edge, and some next level shit. And being an older artist, I, you know, I'll be celebrating my 30 year anniversary um, this month. And so I've watched the music industry change from analog to, you know, from from vinyl to cassettes, cassettes to CDs, CDs to MP3s, you know, and watch the record business go from the traditional model of record stores into these online stores. Right. So. Um, for me, it's it's vital that I'm prepared to change with the time when this technology advances. And so 
when I started to find out more and more about not only NFTs, but cryptocurrency and this whole idea of Web3 and the metaverse and where everything is going, I was like, man, I really hope I can find my way into this. And luckily, people who are already in the space reached out to me. So I didn't have to do that much initial heavy lifting, right? These guys kind of carried it for me. But then once they brought this stuff to me, I got very intrigued and I started to do my own research. And now, like just watching these different brands and different people being associated with different stuff and seeing how, you know, this this board Ape Yacht Club Society is expanding, you know, through all facets of entertainment, man. It, it's really cool to watch and it's really fun to be on a certain level, a part of everything that's happening right now. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, you mentioned in a few of the names there, obviously, you're talking about CryptoPunks, Board Ape Yacht Club. I feel like even outside of music, you must have stepped up your own collection as well with this stuff. What's your what's your wallet looking like right now? It's looking pretty good, man. Um, you know, I had the uh, full send meta card. Somebody talked to me about that. Um, I think my first real, real good purchase for me was an in-betweener from Jean Piero. Um, he's a digital artist and he's also the designer behind Drew which is Justin Bieber's clothing line. Um, so I was able, that was like the first thing I was able to mint. Um, Tristan Eaton, who's a good friend of mine. He's an amazing artist and muralist. Um, he released um, some some art called Gemma. Uh, so he gave me an NFT of his and that allowed me to be able to mint stuff. So it's been really, really cool. Um, hundreds, uh, I bought an atom bomb from the hundreds, from Bobby Hundreds. And I caught it at like a really good price. And uh, the ceiling is like two and a half times what it was when I got it. It's just been fun to get my hands on some of this stuff and just watch it grow, you know, but I'm trying to hold on to as much of it as possible personally. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm not in it for like, you know, quick buys and flips. Cause I'll be honest, I wouldn't, I wouldn't faint to understand the industry enough to know what to buy and when to buy it, whatever. I'm finding some cool stuff. I have friends that tell me about some cool stuff happening. I go on, I check it out. You know, it works for me. Uh, people, that, you know, sometimes I've been lucky enough to get whitelisted. Other times I got to get in that thing and mint like everybody else, you know. But it's been fun and exciting, you know, especially like I see now Bape is now getting into the metaverse. That's going to be a drop coming soon. Really interesting, man, to watch how all these brands are finding their way into the metaverse right now. Uh, but yeah, my wallet is, it's okay. You know, it's not crazy uh, because I'm very reserved about like i have crypto that i already have so i'm just kind of playing with house money if that makes any sense like i don't want to look into you know dumping a lot of my personal income into it you know if i make the right decisions and the right choices and make a couple of bucks cool and if not you know they're not going to cut the lights off over here anytime soon you know but it, <laughs> but but it's fun it's fun i have a lot of friends now like everlast the recording artist everlast I talk to him all the time and he's been an art collector for almost 30 years now of all different uh, mediums of art, whether it's sculptures or toys or paintings or what have you. And like, he's like very, very engaged because he just loves art and he loves to appreciate art. And he has many friends that are artists that are releasing NFTs and then other things that he sees that are, you know, maybe based off of hip hop characters or something culturally that he has an attachment to. And he was just cop something, you know, it's, relatively you know most of these things meant typically around 0 0.01 ether so it's only a couple of hundred dollars that you really have to invest um again like i said i'm not i'm not sitting around trying to spend crazy money on some of this stuff but it's been fun man it's it's really fun to have some of this stuff and you know you could send your friend a link to your wallet and show him what you got my good friend um clyde edwards from sneaker box he was hitting me he was like yo i see you got in between her I bought one too. Check out my wallet, and I sent in my wallet. We just kind of compare different stuff that people got. Man, it's a, it's a different thing that people can bond over too. You know, like I have a lot of friends that are into sneakers. There's a lot of sneaker based NFTs. Nikki Diamond sent me over some crypto dunks that he's doing. You know what I'm saying? And now other people that I didn't even know were into NFTs, like yeah, I got a crypto dunk too. I'm like where? Yeah, it only cost me point one ether to mint. So it was like it was nothing. It's fun, man. It's really fun and interesting to see how this space is uh connecting with people and how how different people's entry points vary based on their cultural cues you know yeah and i think your approach with it in terms of you're trying to buy these things and hold them you're not trying to flip them 
that's what separates the genuine aspect of being both someone that's producing art but trying to consume it in the space versus the cash grabs. And I know that's something that both you and Spotty have been focused on, making sure that the stuff you're putting out isn't just a cash grab. You're trying to put out something that people should want to buy and hold the same way you do with others. And I'm curious, are there certain things that you did to make sure that that was the image that was being presented or the way that people would see it if they wanted to buy it? Because I know that with something like NFTs, that can be a delicate thing to balance. I think through a lot of this, you know, especially with particularly with this collaboration with Spotty, I kind of followed his lead um, and I didn't want to put too much of myself on it because I was new in the space. Um, I didn't want to over talk myself. I didn't over want, want to overstep my boundaries and I didn't want to mess up Spotty's reputation. He's very well known and very well respected in the space. So for the most of the times, I just kind of took his lead on a lot of this stuff. He would recommend certain things to me. I would approach things from a very typical traditional um release standpoint and engagement standpoint and he was like no well i was like should we go on instagram live and he was like well no these things tend to work better on twitter spaces you know so little things like that helped me connect and and figure out the space um a lot quicker um but spotty i mean he was already releasing music as nfts prior to our collaboration so the system was already set up. I just tried not to step on anybody's toes, get in anybody's way. Um, but I was curious about a lot of things as far as intellectual property and ownership. And, you know, it's very interesting how some of these things work, depending on what you're releasing, whether it's still or it's video or it's music, you know, different rules apply. Um, so it's been educational for me as well. And now that I have this information, I have a lot of other artists, typically from my generation, who are curious about it, who don't have a spotty that they can go to. So I can kind of give them very base entry level instructions and try to point them in the right direction. But it's 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 not the easiest thing for people to navigate a Discord if they've never really been on one before and don't really know the terminology and how the communication is happening in the space. So and that's for me. Like I was just talking to a friend last night. Like, yo, how do you monitor these? these discords, like, how do you know who's minting what and where? And he's like, man, it's a language. You just got to figure out how to talk it. And once you figure out how to talk it, it's you, you'll see everything happening. So I'm still learning. It's a process for sure. Cause this isn't the space that I naturally operate in, but I'm always up to learn something new. Right. And I, cause I think that's the perspective that obviously separates you from someone that would even want to try to do this as a cash grab to begin with. You already had a clear understanding and then you have someone that's willing to ride it with you and then you can help do other, help support other people with that too. But yeah, it's, it's a lot I could imagine. And now that you've gotten yourself up to speed with it, I wonder how this will shape how you choose to release your music in the future overall with nfts but then obviously traditional album releases and things like that well it's just a, a a further extension right it just gives me a deeper way of connecting with my base and with people who appreciate my art so typically we would only sell music to people we would only be able to communicate to people through social media but now in the metaverse right like i can sell tickets to a virtual concert while they're at the virtual concert, they can buy virtual merchandise, right? There's so many different ways that we can connect with people. And it doesn't all have to be monetary, right? We can have very real conversations. It's, you know, these Twitter spaces have been very interesting in the terms of learning how people view art that don't necessarily have an entry point to me as a musician, right? So in determining, like in the future, what kind of NFTs we want to be involved with and how we want to present it, um, it has to be true to me and my art and what I represent. So a lot of those things won't maybe necessarily connect and it won't be something that I could sell for a bunch of money, even if I wanted to. But the reality is, is that I can't afford to, for this to be a cash grab because I've got 30 years of reputation on the line, right? And I've always been upfront with people um, about what it is I represent and what I'm presenting. And so for, for me, this is just fun, right? It's very... It's fun. I'm trying not trying to sell stuff at an expensive price. I just want people to have a deeper experience in something that they're already enjoying, which is my music. So if we could create these 
remixes, right? Or like what I'm doing with Spotty, where we're allowing people to remix the song and present it, right? Like that's that's fun, that's dope. Um, and but it's not something that would traditionally only play through a, a DJ or on a radio station, right? This thing will live and breathe on an entirely brand new platform. And it will inspire other people to approach these things from a different aspect or a different angle. And that's all I really want to do. As the OG, I'm typically the one that has to bite the bullet on this stuff, jump out there first, see if it's viable, see if it makes sense, and then show other people, hey, this is cool. Come on, you guys. It's safe to go this way. That's really all I'm trying to do now. You know, Not necessarily for a lot of young people, because they get it. Younger people are more tech savvy than, say, my generation is, right? I want to let them know that this is a safe space that they can operate in. But you can't jump in here looking for money because these people can smell a poser a mile away. They can tell if it's a rug pull. They know what's going on because they were here first. You're the new guy, you know? So, but it, it's, it's, um, it's encouraging. I will say that it is encouraging um, as an artist. You know, what new ways can I find to make this experience with the people that are appreciating my art and my music? deeper you know how can it go further how can it last longer that's that's a beautiful thing yeah and that's a good point you mentioned earlier you especially within your generation have always been the experimenter you've always been more willing to put yourself out there and then see uh what it's like and then put others up on game how do you think that developed like where did that you know dynamic come from for you well, you got to understand, I started rapping 30 plus years ago when it wasn't even a viable uh, job, right? People weren't rich from rap when I first got into it, it but it was new. It was it was amazing, right? The, the graffiti aspect of it, the breakdance aspect of it, watching the DJ manipulate the records and watching these guys create songs impromptu, like right in front of you. It was amazing. It was something I wanted to be a part of. And Back then, you know, my mother was against it. A lot of people didn't think I would make it and be successful. But I was like, look, I'll give it some time. I'll give it a shot. I'll at least take a chance. You know, for me, I've always been open-minded to take a chance on things. And not everything works out. But typically when they do, they work out big, you know. So, um, you know, no risk, no reward. That's always been, you know, my personal motto. And, you know, as long as it doesn't hurt somebody physically, as long as, doesn't compromise my family's financial and physical security. I'm open for it. You know, I'm willing to test it. And from where I'm from, if I don't try it first, some people will never give it a chance, you know? So again, if you, you know, if you call yourself an OG, then you have to put yourself on the front lines for all types of things, you know, not just music and hip hop or street related stuff, but even with, you know, technology and finance and all this type of stuff, I want people to get the best experience they can out of life, you know, and if I can live life and show people, hey, this is okay to do, this is safe, you know, encourage people to take a chance and jump off that cliff and see, you know, saying if we can swim when they land, I'm, I'm with it, you know, because it's worked out for me. And I know there were a lot of things I was able to accomplish that people said I couldn't do. So I want to encourage as many people out there as possible to take chances as well. Yeah, you mentioned there earlier with that, your mother in this and just, you know, her maybe not necessarily seeing it. And I think I heard you say this once that she didn't think that this was real until you were in Big Pimpin'. And that's when it like clicked for her. She was like, oh, okay, like this is real now. Well, uh, well a little earlier than that, um, but right right around that same time, like we were, we had the number one album in Jet Magazine. And that was like a big deal, right? Because that was, for her generation, the only way to gauge that kind of stuff. They really weren't into Billboard magazine. They didn't, you know, charts and all of that type of stuff. So that's where people would look at it back at Jet Magazine. You'd see the top singles and the top albums. And when I had the top album in Jet Magazine, she kind of had to look and take notice. She was like, you really do make music because there was no way for her to really gauge it. We didn't have a lot of music videos. Uh, we didn't have a lot of media exposure. You know, um, a lot of it was really word of mouth our earliest years um, as recording artists, even though we were signed to a major label. So nothing in my life showed that I was like a recording artist. I didn't really have, you know, the money or the cars, you know, to really show that I was doing all this stuff. I couldn't point at this magazine and say, look and see me. I couldn't point at this TV show and say, hey, there goes my video. So, it, you know, it was these small little moments that my mom could relate to because a lot of hip hop culture, my mom didn't have a frame of reference for, you know. 
I mean, that's a good thing too, because, you know, this is a very different environment sometimes that we can operate in. Pimp's mom was always deeply involved in, in our career. And I wasn't always crazy about that because there's a lot of rooms that I felt she shouldn't have been in because things can get very aggressive sometimes. Um, but saying all that to be to, to be said, once I did go out and show my mom that I was capable of doing it, she was all in. She's one of my biggest supporters now. But again, sometimes you just got to go out there and throw caution to the wind. And that's always been this reoccurring theme in my life where, you know, I have no idea where the next road is going to lead me, but I have to be prepared to take that step regardless, you know? Definitely. And I think with that, you mentioned Pimp C earlier. I feel like you and him together, just imagining what you all would have done and what UGK's NFT approach and Web3 approach would have been like, it would have been crazy. Well, Pimp was very big about interaction, right? He was really, you know, we would have concerts and, you know, we'd be done on stage, say, you know, 1.30 and we probably wouldn't leave the club till 2 o'clock because taking pictures and signing autographs and just talking to people. Pimp was really big on wanting to like stick around after the show and like actually communicate with people. He was always curious as to what was on people's minds. And right now he would have been all over, I believe, like the metaverse and this idea of, because I remember he was, he introduced me to Laserdisc, right? Like I, I had no idea what Laserdisc was. And I was the movie guy. That was the crazy thing. I was the big movie buff that watched all the films. And he was like, man, I think you would, like this because you can watch the movie and the director will talk to you like the commentaries and all that stuff so he was all and he was a producer he worked with a lot of you know recording equipment so he had to be on the cutting edge of technology many people don't know that riding dirty is one of the first albums to actually be recorded in pro tools so it's one of the first rap albums to be recorded um fully into um digital format you know and we were using it in a beta as a beta version so we were testing the technology and this is back in 1995, back 1996, you know. So we were always trying to take advantage of advances in technology throughout our career. So it would be no surprise that this would be something that he would be trying to be a part of as much as possible. And I mean, he was, you know, he was already a very animated person. So a cartoon character with Pimp Z based on it in this, you know, NFT world, you know, you could have put different hats, different color meat coats on him. He would have had a ball with it, I guarantee. Oh, I could have. I could have only imagine. I'm thinking about a clip of you all from International Players Anthem music video. That would go crazy. Oh yeah, definitely. You know, and and again, you know, you never know what people gravitate to, right? And that's why it's important to just throw it all up against the wall. I talked about this yesterday with Spotty, and was just like, man, you you never know what it is people like about what you do. So you just give them everything you got, present yourself fully, you know what I'm saying? Be an open book, be as transparent as possible and let the people decide what it is they love about you. And once you find that connection point, you can expand on that and grow that connection. I think NFTs is the perfect place for that because it, it, it allows multiple interpretations of a theme that's already associated with you. Right, right, for sure. I think with this too, there's so much that's already new. And I think to a lot of people, you're definitely on the cutting edge with this. And I think naturally you're probably like, okay, well, what is that thing going to be like three years from now, five years from now that everyone's gravitated towards? Do you have any ideas on what that could look like in music? Well, I think for one in music, I think a lot of, especially we look at, you know, with the, with social distancing and the pandemic and how, People had to start doing like online concerts and verses and all of this different stuff. I do believe that, you know, if you remember last year, Travis Scott and I think Justin Bieber both did virtual concerts, right? Travis did one on Fortnite. Um, I think you'll see a lot more of that because it allows for more artistic interpretation um, for the performer, right? So you can do things in a metaverse concert that you maybe can't do in real life, right? Levels of production, interaction, uh, people communicating to you in real time, right? In ways that you probably couldn't do in the middle of a fully organized and fully produced concert. I just think it allows people who appreciate what you do to have more access to you and what you do. And I think that for me is where things are going to go. I think, I think there's going to be more 
I think not only are we going to spend more time in the metaverse, I think we're going to be concerned about how we look in a metaverse, how we present ourselves in a metaverse. Um, as far as technology, you know, I think it would be a lot closer to Ready Player One um, in the virtual sense, but not in the real world being this dystopian future kind of thing. I think we're okay for the next couple of years. I don't think mankind's going to, you know, turn into Mad Max that quick, right? But <laughs> I do think that people are going to spend, want to spend. I want to say that they, everyone will want to spend more time. I think for me, in the next three years, there's going to have to be some type of technological advance in the way we enter the metaverse because VR headsets for many people can be a very cumbersome thing to deal with for an um, extended period of time. And for me, that's the only thing with being in, in virtual reality for more than 20, 30, 40 minutes is the fact that the headset can, can get hot, especially if you're playing like Fruit Ninja or boxing or working out, right? It gets hot, it gets sweaty. It's it's a lot. You know, I think as I think as the technology starts to advance on that aspect, people will be more willing to get into it because it's it's kind of off putting this big headset and these paddles and all of that. I think at some point, you know, if you look at the who is it that work is working with Oakley? Is it Facebook or Google that has the the glasses? Oh. Or is it you don't know, YouTube? Yeah, it's YouTube, right? Where with Oakley, where you can film things directly from from the glasses. I think technology is going to lean more in that direction. I think we, I think, I think we will be able to incorporate more of the metaverse on top of the real world, so that you will be cognizant of where you are in the real world at the same time, so you're not tripping over the coffee table. Or something because people are going to want to incorporate this more into their everyday life. You won't be able to drive with it or maybe walk down the street with it, but I think you can move around in shared spaces a little bit better, you know. But like that's just me. I just want this to be a more pleasant experience and easily accessible experience. I think at some point the metaverse will be as easily accessible as Wi Fi. If you can find a Wi Fi connection, you can jump right into the metaverse and connect with people in places. That's a hundred percent. Starbucks right? is going to look real different. Starbucks is going to look a lot different in three years. I can tell you. <laughs> yeah, I think I think that's it because when I think about the VR companies like Magic Leap or Oculus, where I think their growth slowed a bit was exactly what you said. Having that headset on for a long period of time does create a barrier and friction on so many levels, and I think that's why for that moment we saw faster movement and growth in AR as opposed to VR, right? So I think yes. the next motion of that is like what you're saying with glasses. It's like a hybrid of those. You still have the thing over you, but it's still layered on top of the real world. You can still interact with whatever's happening around you. The only problem is is peripheral, right? Like you have to figure out where the peripheral would stop with glasses, right? At some point you still have to have temple coverage, right? In order to fully be in const in this space, but that doesn't, that's not always going to work. So it's, I think as long as someone can like with the click of a button, like tap into the real space and then back into the metaverse, like the in and out, right? Um, the accessibility, I think, um, to and back and forth, that's going to be the thing that I'm sure there's somewhere in, in, in the R&D department trying to figure out right now. Definitely. Because I think this would be amazing, like on flights. Like if just think if you have like a long international flight, right? You you know, you get tired of watching movies and listening to music and food. You can jump on, you know what I'm saying? As long as there's like a Wi-Fi experience, you can jump into the metaverse right there, you know, and interact with other people on the plane, right? Without you know, without having to get up and go there. You could find out somebody in 34C is interested in the same things as you, you know. It could get sketchy too. You know, that could get sketchy too. I've been on planes before where people were randomly airdropping pictures to people that maybe they didn't want airdropped to them. Um, but look, that look, the world is full of wonder. I'm excited about the future. Always have been, always will be. Yeah. And I also think we're still in the early days of this too. I mean, it's very real yeah, that right. I know that I know that Facebook changed its name to Meta and they may seem like the leader, but these companies, especially the new ones, they're growing fast. Every new social platform grows faster than the one before that. And like we're saying, five years from now, just think about like how quick TikTok blew up or how yes. quick Clubhouse blew up in that you know, few months. Not just right? that it grew up, it's prevalent and it's accepted, you know, across the board. 
you know, of different cultures, languages, gender identity, everybody's getting it the same way. I talk about this all the time. Every now and then technology comes to people or an idea or some level of art is presented and everyone receives it generally the same way, right? And I think that the metaverse is going to get to a point where it can present itself to the average consumer who isn't tech savvy, who doesn't have cryptocurrency, who doesn't have a MetaMask wallet with, with NFTs and tokens in it, but will still want to interact and engage. You know, I saw it with the Nintendo Wii. I think the Nintendo Wii doesn't get enough credit for being a precursor to this. You know, that was something that everybody wanted to see what their face would look like, what their avatar would look like on the game. And we could bowl and play tennis and all of that. Right. I think that's going to come back around. I think we're going to see a happy medium between what we know um, VR to be and what we want VR to be very soon. I think there's too many companies investing in a technology. There's too many upstarts and there's too many people whose whose minds are now focused on this. It's happening. It's not about a matter of if, it's when. It's happening right now. And everybody's getting on board. All these big corporations that you see creating NFTs and trying to sell NFTs. I remember when I saw the Macy's Thanksgiving Parade floats were being sold as NFTs. I'm like, okay, and like, this is Macy's people, right, right? right? You know what I'm saying? Like, get on board. Like, everybody can get on board. And you can hold out if you want. I held out on Twitter. I held out on Instagram and social media. And I'm pretty sure it cost me It cost me money at some point. It cost me connectivity at some point. It, you know, it cost me relationships because I wasn't there early, right? A lot of people that got there early were able to take full advantage of it. And, you know, a lot of us are still playing catch up with this kind of stuff. So as far as the, the, the you know, Web3 and the metaverse, I want to be, if not ahead of the game, at least have my finger right on the zeitgeist and on the cusp of what's to come. That Nintendo Wii example is a really good one for a few reasons, because I think it also signaled what people think is the real technology advancement, if that makes sense. <laughs> because up yes. until that point, everything was about graphics. How can the Xbox One be have greater graphics than the Xbox 360 or the PS4, whatever it is? How close to reality can it look? Right. Right. And their whole thing was like, okay, maybe if it's less about that, but more about like, okay, what is the actual experience that you can create with other people and making people do things? And that's why we blew up when it did, when it did, you know? Yeah, that's because what it it's about. about what's the goal, right? What was the goal of the Nintendo Wii? For people to enjoy it together, right? So they focused on that instead of how pretty the picture was going to look and how sharp the animation was going to look and how fluid everything was going to be. No, it just... You know, the avatars, just like the Apple avatars, right? They're fun, neat, animated character caricature versions of who we are, right? It's like spending the day at the pier or something, you know? And and it allows the kids to play a game with the parents, to play a game with the grandparents. You know, Nintendo Wii changed Thanksgiving weekend and changed Christmas and New Year's, right? Because now the whole family can gather around the television and instead of watching a movie, we can all do Nintendo Wii bowling. I feel like technology is going to get more and more into that. The metaverse lends itself to that. You know what I'm saying? Especially if, say, you can get on on your iPad, you can get on on your cell phones, the kid can get on on his um, on his Nintendo, right? Um, I can get on on my phone and we can all be interacting, playing games against each other. You know, uh, what was it? There was... Um, there was virtual dominoes. I remember that became a big thing during the, the pandemic because people in different houses could play dominoes against each other. People who would normally come together and commune and play dominoes in person could play it virtually. Now imagine if there's an avatar, you know what I'm saying? There's benefits. The winner could get this. We could all put 0 0.01 uh, ether or something. To, you know, I don't want to you know, encourage gambling, but you know, it's just different ways for us to have fun together. You know, and I think, I think the metaverse is going to be perfect for that because if everybody just has to put something on, then we're all there now. You know, I love the idea of, of, of virtual art galleries where you could have the stuff that's in your wallet and it's on the wall and you can display it and present it to other people. You know, you can go by someone's gallery and look at their art. They can come and look at yours. Um, we'll be having listening parties. People can come and commune and play albums and preview music and videos. Just look, the world is wide open, man. It's just about, how open you are to it. 
that's exciting. And I'm excited for that. I know you're going to be up on all of that. And I, I mean, I can't wait. I feel like, of course, with some of these things, you always feel it out to see, okay, what is, you know, the worthwhile thing to put the investment behind, but there's always going to be things. And I think, I think it's going to be bright ahead. So I can't wait for that. Switching gears a bit though. I want to talk a bit more about hip hop and I want to talk okay. about Houston specifically because obviously you're a legend of this game, you know, put in Port Arthur, Texas on the map. And it's been great. You mentioned Travis Scott earlier. It's been great to see what he's done. It's been great to see what Meg the Stallion has done as well. And I feel like, you know, you've mentioned that, especially in the 90s, Houston necessarily wasn't getting, you know, all the love that it definitely deserved. And now we are starting to see a few more Houston artists get some of that mainstream public, get some of that mainstream awareness that maybe the earlier generation didn't get. But I'm curious, where do you think things are right now? Do you feel like Houston is finally getting its fair share? Or do you think there's still some room there for the region? Well, I think what I think the only thing that has, has really held us back here has always been media, the media accessibility, right? Um, not being in New York and not being in Los Angeles, which are media capitals of the world, not just of the U.S., right? They're all the accessibility to magazines, to um, TV shows, right? To entertainment conglomerates in general, all the access is there. We've always been operating on the outside. Well, now with social media, it kind of levels the playing field. And if we're all operating on a level playing field, then yes, we can compete with anybody. We can compete with any and everybody on any level. So that's why I think you start to see more, not just prominence of, of Houston artists, but Houston artists on a major level, right? Because everybody can be a part of the experience at the same time. People now have been educated to Houston's street scene, Houston's music scene. Everybody knows what the car, the candy painted cars are, you know, DJ Screw, they know all of that. Everybody has the cultural cues to it. And since we're all operating on that same even plane, let's just see who's got the best talent and who presents themselves in the best way. And you'd be hard pressed to find somebody to present that presents themselves live on stage in person better than someone like a Travis Scott or a Megan Thee Stallion. Obviously, Travis has it, you know, has a lot that he's going through right now, but I don't think anyone would ever say that Travis wasn't one of the best performers out there, right? So if we're given the same opportunities and the same platforms that everyone else has to present ourselves to the masses, Houston has just a chance, if not even more of a chance of being successful on a grand scale than everyone else, because we had to learn how to operate without mass media outlets. You know what I'm saying? So if we can build up a following based on that, well, once we get access to the media outlets, well, it's game over at that point, right? So, yeah, I, I look at a lot of the talent, you know, people like Max O'Cream on the edge, you know, people like Fat Tony. There's a lot of great up and coming talent coming out of Houston. Sauce Walker, Peso Peso, uh, Trill Sammy, Dice Soho, a lot of really good talent coming out of the city. And they're all finding their fan bases through social media. So they're con the people that they are connecting with, while it may not be a million people at one time, that 150, 250,000 group um, that they're connecting with, they're building strong connections. They're building connections that will last for years to come. And it's important to do that. I tell artists all the time, you don't need a million fans to make a million dollars. You know, that's a big misconception that you need to sell a million things to someone for a million dollars, to make a million dollars to a million people. No, it's not, it doesn't have to be that off. You're consistent. 10,000 people spending money with you, 10,000 people spending 50 bucks with you on a monthly basis will make you a millionaire in a year. So don't be greedy, just be consistent and patient. Definitely. And I think too that obviously the internet helped democratize so much of this, but to your point, and I think you're still highlighting this, the media still does make a difference for a lot of these artists and especially in the hubs that they're in. So I feel like it's getting closer to that point where things are equalized, but unfortunately there still is some benefit that the artist that is close to the New York or close to the LA would have. But I'm curious, especially as we're thinking about whether it's the metaverse or just future 
development in different areas, if that piece will continue to change, if the media, especially the hip hop entertainment media, will start to become even more democratized at that from that perspective. I think we have an advantage because there's always been this independent spirit, right? That if the powers that be won't allow us to use their platforms, then we'll create our own, right? And it's that self-sufficient mindset, right? Self-sustaining mindset that would lend itself to this, right? It would lend itself to the point of content creation, right? We don't sit around and wait to find out who can distribute our content the best, who can we partner with? No, we're going to figure out a way to create this content independently. And because of that, we are now the sole owners of the intellectual property. All of that term, all of that knowledge and application lends itself to the metaverse, right? Because you have your own small group of people, right? That have been supporting you outside of the major media system. So now you start a discord with those people. And now all those people are communicating with each other in real time, constantly and consistently. You can find out exactly what it is that they all have in common in terms of their connection with you. And now you can feed that beast properly. You can give it a better diet because it's more refined. You know exactly what it is that they're coming for. It's for sustenance, right? So you can take all of the filler out of the presentation and just give them exactly what it is that they need. You can't ask for a better access to that for that for, from an artist's perspective, right? This is exactly what you would want. People used to pay tens of thousands of dollars for people to have special interest groups come in and tell them what people are thinking. Now you can have a place where all of the people that support you, like you and listen to you and appreciate you can come together and talk about what it is they like and maybe what it is they don't like. So you can have a, a more fine-tuned perception of what it is that people are supporting you for. We are in perfect position, being from Houston, being self-sustained, being creators, content creators, and owners, right, to understand how to take full advantage of what the metaverse and Web3 has to offer. That's why me personally, I want to make sure that I'm out here leading the charge, not just for the next generation, but for prior generations. There's a place and space here for everybody. You know what I'm saying? And you don't need to wait until people invite you. It's wide open right now. Make yourself at home. Love that. Love that. That's what it's about, making the opportunities. No, that's amazing. That's amazing. A uh, couple of questions here before we before we let you go. I want to chat with you about the restaurant business, because I know that's something yeah. that you've been deep in. Um, I know you actually had teamed up with uh, my guy, Premium Pete, as well, on a few things in this space. Uh, and I know that you recently uh, started Trill Burger. It'd be great to hear how that's been going and what your vision is and outlook is for that. Well, if anybody that knows me can look at me and you can tell that I, I, I like food, right? When I go to kid around with that, I'm a big boy and I like food. But as I've gotten older, I've gotten to appreciate the process more uh, of cooking, and but then also how restaurants work. I've made good relationships with a lot of people here in the restaurant and culinary world. And I've just been on the outside for so long. It's like, I'd love to have an entry point into this business, right? I'm not necessarily a chef by trade or nature. My wife and I do a lot of cook. We used to do a lot of cooking demos um, and whatnot, but it was just about finding the right place, you know, and the right place to enter and make it make sense. Um, good friends of mine owned a restaurant here in town, Sticky's Chicken, uh, Patsy and Benson, brother and sister, you know, great business. Um, and they were bought out by a restaurant group who wanted to partner with me on a concept as well. Um, so between myself, the team at Sticky's Chicken, um, the restaurant group that was approaching me uh, and a good friend of mine, Nick Skirfield, who kind of helped bring everything together. They presented this burger concept. I had my own ideas of what it should be. We agreed on the inception and the idea and the concept, presented it to the public, and it's been going amazing ever since. You know, We've been able to present it at a lot of great places like Complex Con, Astroworld. We're set to do it at uh, Coachella uh, pretty soon. Um, so there's just a lot of great opportunities that are coming from that. Once people saw that I wanted to be more active in the food space, different people started to reach out. So I'm currently working with Paul Key, an award-winning chef uh, from Texas, on a soul food restaurant concept with my wife, Queenie Soul Food. So that's going to be the next thing. And looking at a lot of different local brands here that are doing amazing things with food, but could use maybe a little bit more energy and 
maybe a little bit more awareness to take them to the next level. So I'm looking to partner with people as well, not just building original concept, but seeing concepts that are really well thought out, really well fleshed out, have amazing food. And again, could just use maybe a little energy or a little like, hey, come over here and try this. So, you know, I, I think in the next three to five years, man, I think there's going to be a lot of really, really good opportunities for me in that space. We're already talking about how that translates into the metaverse and 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 the idea of, you know, things happening in the real world as well as in the virtual world. So there's a lot of great ideas that we have on the table. I don't want to give everything away, but I think by the time we get to maybe NFT Denver or NFT LA, we'll be presenting some of these new ideas on behalf of myself and, and the guys that I'm in business with. So, um, you know, the food industry is exciting for me to be a part of, but it's not just about brick and mortars and it's not just about real world application. There's also room for this to extend into the metaverse as well. And we're all excited about that. I was just going to say, when you started talking about this, I'm already seeing a headline soon enough. Trill Burger has bought real estate in the metaverse <laughs> to open up shop. <laughs> Hey, look, man, look, anything is possible nowadays. Like I said, this space is wide open. You know, there's a lot of things that my partners and I think make sense for us um, as a new brand, personally, uh, for my brand. Um, they're encouraged to try it. I'm encouraged to support them in trying it. Again, it's not typical. It's not traditional. But I think maybe that's a good thing. You know, I think there's a lot of people looking for things that are outside of the box and outside of the norm. And I think we have some great progressive ideas that we can present to people that'll fall right in line with everything that everybody wants to be a part of the metaverse for. Can't wait. I feel like, you know, I um, can already see the headline coming. So <laughs> I'm excited to see it for sure. But no, for real, no, this will be the last question before we let you go. You were on the I'm an Athlete podcast a couple, <laughs> um, pretty recently. You was with yes. uh, Brandon Marshall and Perk and a bunch of them. And you were talking about how Tom Brady is the Jay-Z of the NFL. And then you yeah. also mentioned that Aaron Rodgers is more like Nas. So who is the Bun B in the NFL? Who is Bun B? Wow. Um, you know, I, when we had that conversation, I was asked that. And I didn't have a, a good answer at the time. As I thought about it, I'm, I've always been a fan of Frank Gore, the running back. Um, Frank Gore is, I think he's 40 right now, um, still out there, one of the strongest, toughest guys in the game, going up against the Young Bucks, you know. Um, he always does well enough, right? Like he's he's not going to be the top running back, you know, maybe not even in the top 20, but he always does the job. He comes, he gets the job done, and he's a real leader in a locker room because he's a veteran. And that's why I want to be somebody that, look, if I show up, I'm going to do what I said I'm going to do. You know what I'm saying? And I'm going to try to encourage other people and lead them in the right way because I've been playing this game maybe longer than you guys are. And I can probably help you work smarter instead of working harder. You know, so I would say probably like a Frank Gore. But that's just me because I really like his his, his style of play. That's a good answer. And I think he's actually up there in yardage. He might be top five for NFL for uh, running back running yards back. Oh, no, up he's there. Top right? He's top 10. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He yeah, so, so he, quietly, right? Very, very quietly. quietly. Those numbers like, yeah, people wouldn't think that. But I couldn't see you getting in the ring with Darren Williams, though. I could not see that happening. No, 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 no. I'm not going to play that <laughs> game. I'm talking about on the field. I would make a better decision <laughs> off the field than that. I'm not playing those kind of games. <laughs> you got to know your weight class. No, for sure. It's funny. When I was thinking about this for you, the name that came to mind for me was Randall Cunningham. And here's why. Because wow. I think about okay. someone like him, an originator who, when he was, especially when he was doing his thing in Philly, I feel like that was just when people were starting to see, you know, the quarterback that could run and the quarterback that could throw and do his thing. And in many ways, that person paved the way for the Mahomes of today and all of these guys that can do these things when the rules have changed a little bit. You know, there's a whole bunch of more pass coverage. You're a little bit kinder to quarterbacks in a way where someone like Randall Cunningham could have had, you know, you know, who knows what Randall Cunningham could do in this era, but it wasn't for Randall right. Cunningham doing what he did. He paved the way to make it possible for the young cats today. I like the correlation. I like that. I like, I'm not mad at that. I'm not mad at that.
<laughs> Randall nah, coming. I'm with that. I'm with that. Nice, nice. That's good. You, you didn't compare me to a scrub, so that's dope. That's dope. I'm with <laughs> For sure, for sure. Well, Bun, this is fun, man. I appreciate you for coming on. This was I mean, I think people are going to get a lot out of this combo for sure. And I know we talked in the beginning about everything you've got coming up, but what are some things coming up soon in the next couple of months that you want to plug or let the Trapital audience know about? Oh, um, on March 11th, March 11th is going to be a big day for me. Um, I'm going to be performing in Houston at the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo. Um, for people that aren't from Houston, this is the 90th year. So it's a big part of Houston culture and tradition. And I'm the first black man from Houston to headline um, this 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 uh, event. So we're doing a, a big event there. I'm bringing out a lot of guys like Slim Thug, Paul Wall, Mike Jones, and bringing out a lot of local guys because you know we've never been able to be a part of this on this level. And so I, I want to share this moment with other people who grew up in the city like me and understands what it means to be able to be a black man from the city on that stage. You know. Um, on that same day, I'm re releasing a new album. It's called Mo Trill. It's a collaboration with a producer from Houston named Corey Mo, one of Pimp C's production protégés. Um, and so we have a collaborative album together. The first single is out right now. It's called Hesitate. It's with me, Toby and Wigway, um, Talib Kweli, and David Banner. Um, and um, it's uh, it's a more mature album. You know, like I'm I'm, I'm acting my age. You know, I'm age appropriate. And I want to make music that people from my generation can listen to and enjoy and be lit on their own level, because there's a lot of things in modern music that people from my generation just can't relate to, you know what I'm saying? Or maybe appreciate on the level that it should be appreciated. So I want to make sure that I'm still making current new music for people who've been along with me on this 30 year journey. You know what I'm saying? I'm not going to leave them here like this. We're going to keep going until we can't no more. I love so that. March 11th, right. man, to be looking for a lot from me that day. And a couple of different surprises, too. I got a lot of things coming up in this metaverse space, you know, a couple of collaborations. Now that I have a clear idea of what people would want from me, that was really a lot of what I was trying to do was to figure out how would people want an NFT from me? What would, you know, what, what would you want to see from me? What would make sense from me, right? And so I think we've got a really good idea of how to present ourselves in the space, make it easy, um, you know, make it not just a, um, you know, an NFT, but also something that has something tangible physically attached to it, you know, make it a deeper experience for people. Um, and we got some really good ideas. I'm partnering with a good friend of mine and I think we're gonna have something to present to people, hopefully by March, that'll be really fun and encouraging, but will extend throughout the year. Like it's, we've got some really cool stuff attached, so. Um, just keep your eyes open. Keep following me on social media on Instagram at Bun B on Twitter at Bun B Trilogy uh, and on Facebook at the Real Bun B of UGK. Um, and stay posted. We're gonna be oh, and we got the Discord coming soon. So stay tuned to my Twitter. Um, we will probably be putting all the Discord information out through the Twitter page. So because I noticed that a lot of energy from Metaverse and and uh, Web three tends to take place on Twitter. So we're moving all that energy there so we can go straight to the people that are already engaged. Uh, but we're excited for what the year has to be, you know, has in store and years to come. We'll keep an eye out for that, man. Excited for you. Can't wait. Thanks, Fun. Man. Thanks again, man.